This Sunday is the beginning of Advent week four, the last week of the season leading up to Christmas in the Episcopal Church. Today we heard the Annunciation story that has been read and reread for over 2,000 years. The virgin birth that is celebrated over and over, bringing to us the continued hope of redemption and the forgiveness of our sins and a renewed sense of the kingdom of God as we approach a new year. God loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to show us how to love in an unselfish and compassionate manner. The Gospel of Luke is the only place in the Bible where we experience Mary's reaction and her response to the announcement that she is to be the mother of the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Mary's memory and contribution to Christianity is most often only revered or mentioned during the season of Advent or Christmas time. Generally, Mary is seen simply as the model of motherhood. Sometimes she becomes a role model for feminist identification. Mary the Virgin has known no man. She is her own person, unexploited. Her identity is not given to her by any male, but is her own a gift from God. Looking at this passage from the Gospel of Luke, we see another image. The evangelist Luke does not exalt Mary as a goddess, or as a mother, or even as a woman. He thinks she has a more important role as the ideal Christian. In the third Gospel, Mary becomes the model for Christian discipleship. Mary turns out to not simply be the mother of Jesus, but a role model for all those who choose to follow Jesus. A servant of God who embodies faith and faithfulness. This is quite an amazing statement, seeing that Mary is young and female, in a culture that did not regard women as being much more than chattel. Nothing is said specifically in this gospel story of Mary's faith or character. Nothing that helps us understand why God chose her. But as we see in many stories throughout the Bible, with Abram, Isaac, and especially Jacob and David, God chooses whom God chooses. God does not choose those that are well equipped, but equips those he has chose, has chosen. God repeatedly shows us that we do not have to be perfect for the task, but that our faith and our willingness to believe in God's perfect plan are enough for us to be chosen. Mary is not chosen because she deserves favor, but is favored because she has been chosen. Luke wants to make sure we know why she is favored and blessed. Her kinswoman Elizabeth says, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken by the Lord. Notably, she is not blessed because she's going to be the physical mother of Jesus, but because she believed God's word. It is Mary's grace that has attracted God's attention. And what is this grace? It is what Luke shows us in her conversation and her action. Mary shows us her courage, her boldness, and her grit, not submissive weakness. Grace is not submission, and the power of God is never weak. All the odds were against her, and yet she said yes. This was Mary's God moment. Mary's encounter has characteristics that I believe can teach us about God moments. They are initiated by God, not us. Mary didn't ask for the experience she received, nor could she have created it on her own. Only God could do it. That's always true. God moments are unanticipated. Not only did Mary not ask for the experience, she was totally surprised by it. God moments are connected to God's favor. It was a great privilege for Mary to be chosen to be the mother of Jesus. It's a privilege any time God chooses us to fulfill his purpose. 
God moments offer insights from God. Gabriel told Mary things about her future that she could not know. Our encounters with God may not include angels, but that doesn't make them any less supernatural. They require us to say yes. When God invites us into what he's doing, he's giving us a chance to partner with him. But it requires us to say yes to the partnership. It will change your life and those of others. When God gives us an invitation and we choose to accept it, nothing in our lives will ever be the same again. Neither will the lives of others affected by our decision. God moments pull us off balance. They may even overwhelm us. They may disrupt our lives. They may make us uncomfortable. But whenever we are willing to trust God and say yes to him, our lives take on new meaning and direction. You don't want to miss that. Next week is Christmas, the time to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Rejoicing that the Savior of the world continues to show us love beyond measure, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Just like Mary, we too are the chosen sons, daughters, and siblings of God. Jesus continues to encourage us to open our hearts and minds to see things fresh in a new way, in this new season of life and in the upcoming new year. The reality is that each new experience fits into God's kingdom in ways we cannot fully understand. It matters less that we execute our tasks with expertise than that we approach them with devotion. God desires not only the skill of your hands, but the love in your heart. How can we share the grace within by living out of God's abundance? What is God asking you to say yes to? What is that thing that seems difficult, scary, even downright crazy that God keeps placing on your heart? Richard Rohr, in one of his daily blogs, speaks to ways in which we can say yes to God's invitation to be part of the creation story, an opportunity to be a partner in changing the direction of our lives. Ways in which we can be more like Mary, courageous, bold, accepting, and understanding. Not just in the season of Advent, but all year long. I find these to be helpful as we move into a new liturgical year, a new calendar year, a new political era, in which we move towards a reconciliation of our differences, transforming vengeance and threats into forgiveness and blessings, and once again, become the United States of America. When wronged, seek reconciliation in place of revenge. Instead of repaying violence with more violence, seek creative and transforming nonviolent alternatives. Don't focus on external conformity to moral codes, but on internal transformation in love. Don't love insiders and hate or fear outsiders, but welcome outsiders into a new us, a new we, a new humanity that celebrates diversity in a context of love for all, justice for all, mutual respect for all. Don't have anxiety about money or security or pleasure at the center of your life but trust God, but trust yourself to the care of God. Don't hate your enemies or competitors, but love them and do to them, not as they have done to you, and not before they do to you, but as you wish they would do for you. So like Mary, let us proclaim our love and commitment to God in the words of the Magnificat. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. 
The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel for he has remembered his promise of mercy. The promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 